Welcome back. 1989, and the young scrappy game designer Chris Roberts already had a very big dream for his future. He was in Austin, in the center of the country, and very soon, he'd be at the center of the gaming zeitgeist, on the verge of his breakthrough release, the game that would earn him fame, fortune, and critical acclaim. But as Ward Spector later recounted it, Roberts' true ambitions were elsewhere. Someday, Roberts told him, I'll be making movies. In an industry re-establishing itself after the 1983 crash, Robert's cinematic ambitions were a valuable asset. His love of cinema is felt throughout every aspect of Wing Commander. It was key to its runaway success. The market for dogfighters and flight sims was crowded, but their appeal was niche. However, Wing Commander wasn't just another dogfighting game. It was a sci-fi adventure starring you as a hotshot pilot advancing through the ranks in a longshot war against giant cat people. The cinematic flourishes are everywhere, even before the opening credits. It helped give Wing Commander the feeling of starring in a film, even though it was first and foremost a dogfighting game. And it arrived at exactly the right moment, as the Star Wars generation of kids were now teens and young adults with computers in their homes. It was a blockbuster. Origin, the house that Ultima built, finally had the makings of another money-printing franchise that they could build on. Emboldened by their massive hit, Origin refined the cinematic touches that proved so immersive and popular with the first game. While Roberts buried himself in Strike Commander, director Stephen Beeman delivered what most believed to be the franchise masterpiece nine months later, a darker, story-centric animated gem full of colorful companions and plot twists, and he did it on a budget. As Roberts later put it, Wing Commander 1 was cinematic, but in Wing Commander 2 we really tried to create a movie. Yet it was still very much a game. A game with a Saturday morning cartoon style that endeared it with cheesy seriousness. However cinematic it was, it still felt and played like a game. If Wing Commander 2 was figuratively a movie, Wing Commander 3 would literally become one. Basically where Wing Commander 1 and Wing Commander 2 had movie-like aspirations, I would say that Wing Commander 3 is a movie. This was the moment that let game developer Chris Roberts finally attempt to become filmmaker Chris Roberts. He had created a Star Wars-like cartoon experience with his first game, but he was directing Luke Skywalker himself in full motion videos by the third. This new incarnation of Roberts put gameplay in the backseat and cinema in the front. The record-breaking production budget was poured mostly into the movie that you watched, while the game was played between cutscenes. With Roberts enjoying the director's seat, Wing Commander 4 was a headfirst dive into deeper and hopefully richer waters. In reality, Wing Commander 4 was the omen of things to come. Lukewarm reception developed at a loss in the beginning of Risk at First Publishers, separation, and then a recombination under lofty ambitions and a new publisher's checkbook. The chance of a lifetime turned into a universal punching bag, a stopgap that failed to cover a gaping hole, and finally, expulsion from paradise for hubris, twice. Only the story didn't end there. In October of 2012, Roberts reached out to the one audience that didn't work with him professionally, his fans and was resurrected by a bolt of crowdfunded lightning. And when that bolt became a continued downpour of millions, Robert's Hollywood dreams reawakened, and his eyes turned back to those Los Angeles hills. So what is Hollywood? The short answer is, it's a media and entertainment community northwest of downtown Los Angeles. It is home of the Dream Factory, the Magic Store. The long answer, as I hope to make clear, is Chris Roberts' Fool's Paradise. A fool's paradise is a state of deceptive happiness based on illusions or delusions. If you remember from Chapter 2, Robert dove fast and deep into the heart of Hollywood and was spit out just as fast and equally as far. Those moments of being in the Hollywood mix were probably the high water marks of Roberts' life. The past game development accolades do not measure up. For a few years he was on top of the world, or so he thought. Twice upon a time, he was the toast of the gaming world. Yet his dreams are firmly planted in Southern California's entertainment ecosystem, the place he thinks he truly belongs, the place he's going to prove to everyone he belongs. And now nearly two decades later, he is still trying to prove that to everyone. And based upon his actions during this project, as well as his past attempts to get his foot back in the door, I don't think Roberts ever dispelled his delusions of imminent Hollywood acclaim and recognition. Who Roberts was and is changed with the environment he inhabited. There are three places in his life that we can point towards that have crafted the Roberts he projects, as well as aspects he'd rather you not remember. The young Roberts at Origin, the enterprising Roberts of Digital Anvil, of and outside the Hollywood system, and more recently, the legendary Roberts of Star Citizen. Starting from the beginning, let's get to know Roberts as a game developer, a filmmaker and producer, and project manager. 
what is his style, what are his influences, what are his abilities, and finally, where did he go wrong? Roberts, in the past and to this day, works in visuals. He was always pushing for interaction verbs to be visualized, as seen in Times of Lore and Bad Blood. With Winkmander and Beyond, that visual style evolved into cinematic. Roberts felt that visual representation was more tactile and engaging than background text. As preferred style choice, he was ahead of the curve of what the industry would eventually embrace. Game manuals and some world-building stories would remain with his origin games, but Roberts never stopped trying to render and express those details in the games proper. The influences of Roberts are much more apparent than his design philosophy. His early work had high fantasy, Tolkien-esque. Bad Blood had some 2000 AD, but for Wing Commander, and by extension Star Citizen and Squadron 42, space opera and World War II are chiefest of influences. Chris plainly states the influence of Star Wars. Ever since I saw Star Wars as a wide-eyed eight-year-old, I dreamt of being a hotshot pilot saving the galaxy. There's a bit of Battlestar Galactica, too. Wing Commander's Kilrathi had long been suspected as being references to Larry Niffin's book series of the Mankinson Wars, and possibly C.J. Serra's Shanor novels. Roberts must have read them, because they usually feature a traitor subplot, a subplot that Roberts has injected into nearly every game he's been a part of. We look back at Wing Commanders 3 and 4, the last projects that directly involved Roberts ever saw to completion, and with a boss over him in one form or another. At the time, full motion video games were enjoying brief popularity, and with Wing Commander 3 proved to be one of the most commercially popular of the year. As of 1999, Wing 3 had a budget of $4 million, sold 400,000 units, and brought in about $15.9 million in revenue. That's pretty good. Computer Gaming World gave it the Action Game of the Year award in 1995, but elsewhere, another space opera with true Star Wars roots challenged that throne, The Legendary TIE Fighter, which won PC Gamer's 1995 Best Action Game of the Year. The two would jostle each other for awards and positioning on best of lists, but time and remasters were kinder to TIE Fighter as the years passed. Retrospectives aside, Wink 3 did something right for its time and place in gaming history. On the other hand, Wing 4 cost about 10 to 12 million to make sold 170,000 units, and only brought in 7.9 million in 1999. That's not good. So here's a tidbit about the FMV shoots of Wing 3 and 4. Wing 3 saved on filming costs because everything was recorded on VHS tape, not film. Bad and or unneeded takes were recorded over, saving a lot of dosh that otherwise would have been waste. How much? Roberts was known to have about a 17 to 1 takeaway ratio, meaning on average there were about 17 takes to the one that was actually used. Usually you want someone with at least a 5 to 1 ratio to manage cost. Stanley Kubrick went way over 17 to 1, reportedly 102 to 1 on The Shining. But that was Stanley goddamn Kubrick, and he let the man do what he goddamn wanted to when making art. Wing 4 was shot on 35mm film, and was not art. Estimates from sources and documents indicate the total cost of actual film stock alone was between $280,000 and $337,000 to cover an estimated 4,000 plus minutes of film shot to include rolling action starts to arrive at about 3 hours and 30 minutes in the final cut, while a small sliver of budget percentage-wise, that was just for film stock. Reportedly, unexpected high costs for many slivers were common in Wing Force production. Now, both Wing 3 and 4 were filmed in and around LA and Hollywood, with 38 constructed sets between them. The initial draw of Wing 3 for the big-name actors was the novelty of video games and the narrative structure. Hollywood was also taking notice of the use of green screens for post-production set enhancements, something Roberts can hold a claim to as a trendsetter. Roberts was also aware of the wide scope of the project, both gameplay and FMVs, but for Wing 4 that changed. Gameplay was handed off, while Roberts fully concentrating on filming and directing, as sources from Past Origin describe, his chums Mark, Malcolm, and John. Roberts all but abandoned the cost-saving green screens for fully constructed sets with pyrotechnics, stunts, and a wide swath of extras. You could argue that this FMV scope creep and the lack of gameplay innovation is what caused Wing 4 to not make budget, but I would offer you this. It's hard to make a profit on a space sim when it costs more than $6 million to make. I say that because Wing Commander Prophecy, the one made after Roberts left, made $6.7 million off of near enough 200,000 units in 1999. Budget info is scarce, but reportedly Prophecy cost $5 to $7 million to make. To put it into perspective, reportedly Wing 4's filming budget, not including the actual game development, cost $8 million. No wonder Roberts and EA had a spat after Wing 4's release. 
You see, Roberts never really was an employee of Origin. He made games for Origin, funded and published through them and EA, but it wasn't until EA bought Origin that Roberts was under contract. After Wing 4, EA noticed that Roberts' contract was due to expire during the production of Wing 5, or Wing Commander Prophecy as we know it. Noting the short sales, and not wanting to give Roberts negotiating leverage deep in the middle of development, EA wanted to negotiate a new contract before production got too far. Suffice to say, Roberts didn't like the demands and terms, and walked in 1996, establishing the ambitious new studio Digital Anvil. Now, Digital Anvil was a reflection of the state of the video game industry. Big headliner names were either founding new ambitious studios, or taking the reins of their home studio to be more ambitious. Iron Storm, Silicon Knights, and Double Fine were peers of this movement. After his departure from Origin Systems, Roberts collected many ex-Origin employees, some while they still worked at Origin, and secured a $75 million publishing deal with Microsoft. The deal with Microsoft was primarily for three games, Loose Cannon, Conquest Frontier Wars, and Freelancer. Contrary to public recollection, Star Lancer was not initially planned. Star Lancer's reported budget was $7 million, and sold an underwhelming 28,000 units in 2000 for only 1.2 million gross, a reportedly disappointing 400,000 units in 2001, but eventually tallied a profitable 700,000 units by the end of Digital Anvil in 2006. Now I want to make clear, these old figures are from PC data reports and NPD data of the time, and they have holes in their market coverage. However, it's an odd jump of 678,000 units and $28 million over five years. But those are the figures that I have found and have been told as hearsay and rumor, and I suspect they're inflated by bargain bundles or an extra zero accidentally placed. It would do the people of Warthog Games and Digital Anvil a great disservice to say Chris Roberts had anything more than a passing creative input into the development of Star Lancer. Lost in all this hubbub of video games was the partnership of Digital Anvil with local Austin film sweetheart, director Robert Rodriguez. Sources say Rodriguez was intrigued by the multimedia possibilities offered by Digital Anvil and signed on as a consultant and partner. He even had his own office with his name on the door. However, a backlog of old and new projects behind schedule, as well as Roberts' own busy schedule with the Wing Commander movie, kept any collaboration between Roberts and Rodriguez on hold. The office assigned to Rodriguez remained empty and unused, and essentially that talking point was a marketing ploy, though Rodriguez took paychecks nonetheless. The fate of Freelancer was removed from Chris's hands well before release, due to being over budget and underdeveloped. A tidbit I was given from sources as an indication of how mismanaged the project was, was that the opening cinematic for the original vision of Freelancer cost about $950,000 to produce, near enough a full million. Roberts attempted to allay Freelancer's budget concerns by pitching new games to get more money, projects like Bane and Silverheart, but Microsoft was having none of that robbing Peter to pay Paul nonsense after Star Lancer's disappointing sales. I say disappointing, a word used by Eric Peterson in a 2001 interview because it failed to plug a specific financial hole. A specific financial hole, it is alleged, was a major part of the reason Roberts' removal from Digital Anvil during the buyout. Again, this is rumor, but it is corroborated by multiple trusted sources who are at Digital Anvil. It is alleged that Roberts used Microsoft game development money to fund the post-production of the already over-budget Wing Commander movie. Roberts claims the movie budget was close to 20 to 24 million dollars. Other sources cite total costs at about 30 million dollars. It turns out both are actually right. Roberts secured about $20 million from various sources after a me-fed Italy film fest showing off a test trailer. Fox threw in an additional $10 million. There's a convenient gap of about $7 to $8 million. Considering the movie only made back about $11.6 million, and nearly all that profit bespoke for, Microsoft was none too pleased to find a $7 million gap after Roberts asked for more money to complete Freelancer and other projects in 2000. One of the big stipulations of the buyout by Microsoft was the complete removal of Roberts from the company and the barring of him from ever entering the office again. The consultant credit was merely a contractual ghost. Ever plucky, Roberts did show up once late in development, and stories tell of a fun night on 6th Street, but end with that night of past reminiscences. Once again, there is no public evidence of these events, but this alleged story is consistent between trusted sources. So what about the movie? Wing Commander's plot and setting is rife with World War II imagery and media, possibly more than the property the movie is based on. The dive bombing raid of Tora Tora Tora, a DOS boot death charge scene, the crash landing of Midway, and any number of inter-squadron drama involving movies about the RAF. This is all quite clearly attempts at imitation. 
An imitation of the result is not necessarily imitation of the process. What little original material there is does little to distinguish it. Pilgrims are math Jedi, the Kelrathi are inept and forgettable, and one of the few things the movie is remembered for, the space bulldozer, is considered terrible comedy and not tense drama. The film served its $30 million purpose for Fox as a vehicle for a second Star Wars Episode I trailer. With a Rotten Tomatoes rating of 10%, there's little to add in further criticism. As far as the film director Roberts, he wasn't kicked out of Hollywood due to tragedy or bad luck, but inability and hubris. Everything he knew about filmmaking he learned from just watching movies, or the Wing Commander games. No film school education at all. The Wing Commander movie itself was a $30 million film school for Roberts that saw numerous production issues, script problems, and a very cold reception. There are multiple accounts of what happened, from Roberts himself and others involved in the film's production, and they all speak of bad communication, competing ideas, and a lack of focus. There was some forward thinking, but that was more about merchandise. Fact is, aside from an early Fox Silver Surfer project that was quickly mooted, he was never allowed to direct after the critical and commercial failure of his movie, and he was essentially blacklisted from Hollywood after Kevin Costner won his breach of contract court case, setting new legal contractual precedent and standards by losing a lawsuit over oral obligation, and an industry that loves to say, love you, love to work with you, will not endear you to that industry and or community. As to Roberts' producer history, it is my opinion, and one I've been unable to find any relevant Hollywood contacts to confirm or deny, that Roberts' producer roles had less to do with his abilities, or inabilities in this case, and more to do with Ortwin Framer's ability to find projects, to sink retroactively fraudulent tax evasion money from Germany's VIP manifolds that the German government eventually clamped down hard on in 2007. Ascendant Pictures lists 16 films to their credit. But Roberts was only involved in half of those projects. The other half was all Ortwin and the other ascendant partners. Roberts promoted during early Star Citizen slideshow talks that he successfully got $750 million in funding for film projects. But of the nearly 260 ish million spent on movies that Roberts was involved in, they only made back under $200 million. We will further address the Roberts and Ortwin partnership in a future video, as it relates to what happened to the other $500 million. There is a murky hole in the Roberts Hollywood history between the decline of Ascendant Pictures and the 2012 launch of the Star Citizen project. As stated in Chapter 2, Roberts attempted to rub elbows with celebrities in passing with his luxury car rental company out of John Wayne Airport. This corroborated anecdote from sources makes passable sense. John Wayne is known for being the airport of choice for celebrities looking to avoid the congested public of LAX and celebrities are fond of luxury cars that they are not completely responsible for. Much like the stereotype of the waiter dropping a script on the plate of a Hollywood bigwig, Robert sought a new Patreon by virtue of salesmanship. However, that never panned out. As the business allegedly bankrupted due to Roberts' partner running off with the money the business made, leaving debt and other contractual obligations. Roberts would not sell another luxury service for about six years. In other activities, Roberts credits a Chief Creative Officer role at Blink Media International from 2008 to 2011, who is considered at this time a dissolved company. What I've been told was Blink Media was one of many ambitious media marketing companies that disappeared into a trust after distributing a few financial golden parachutes. Reportedly, Roberts was not issued one of these golden parachutes. It's also reported, and something I was told during my time as an investor at CIG, that Blink Media was one of the early promised angel investors that would provide the rest of the funding that the Star Citizen project needed. Suffice to say, the dissolvement of Blink Media put that promise to rest. As to any other Robert's activities during that time, they are scattered, uncorroborated, and honestly not fit for public discussion. But I give you again the account of the one person who knew him best at the time. And so Chris, was, Chris said, well, do you think we could maybe go to Kickstarter or something? He, he kind of felt it was a little risky. Um, and I said, well, you know, you're... You, what he what he does is pretty unique. Nobody else can kind of do what he does. So if no one if no one appreciates you for Star Citizen, then I'm sure you'll get a job. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to do that, I'm sure somebody is going to give you a job. If you don't want to go back into film and you really would like to go back into games. Welcome back to recent history. With the successful funding of the Star Citizen project. Roberts had to set up a studio to make his game. Austin was familiar ground, the largest video game industry hub outside of Southern California. 
once home of Origin Systems and Digital Anvil. The timing for recruiting talent was just right. Lightbox Interactive had just closed up shop after shipping their last game, Starhawk, and there were longtime industry vets looking for work. While a studio headed by Roberts' longtime friend and manager, Eric Peterson, was established, Roberts decided that he would not come back to Austin. Instead, Roberts established an office in Santa Monica, on the boardwalk near the ocean. And ironically, sorry, appropriately, their next door neighbor was the also kickstarted Ouya. Ouya. Over time, the Santa Monica office began stripping development responsibility from Austin, becoming the figurative spearhead of the game's development, where every core department was within a stroll of Roberts' desk. It's no secret that the project was nebulously undefined prior to the GDC Austin presentation, and since then, theme and influence are a potpourri of everything and anything. What's been stated is that the setting is influenced by ancient Roman history, notably Imperial Rome. Star Wars returns as an influence because this is space opera, and of course, the Firefly fantasy, and the specific co-opting of the phrase, Earth. But for all the lore and fiction, there isn't a game to critique yet. But there are over a thousand promotional videos to browse, and the commercials for spaceships are a bit more on the nose. Here's 2001. Here's Top Gear. Here's a Ford truck commercial. Here's Lord of War's intro. Here's Grand Tour. In fact, most of these eight familiar car commercials throughout the years, and rightfully so, they're intended to sell you the idea of owning spaceships. One might say Roberts has some experience in selling people, with money to spend, on luxury vehicles. I hope the irony is not lost on you. So, Star Citizen Fun Fact. In the Ford Truck commercial homage, Roberts wanted to get Dennis Leary, the comedian actor who voiced the actual Ford Truck commercials, to voice his. Leary wanted millions, so instead they got Lance Henriksen for quite a few thousands. Roberts also wanted the actual Jeremy Clarkson for the Top Gear homage, who again asked for millions. I don't know who did the voice, probably somebody cheaper, but just so you understand, Roberts has nearly spent millions on spaceship commercials, and potentially more if he got the talent he wanted at the price they asked for. So Roberts has marginal ability to sell cars, and demonstrated ability to sell spaceships, but what about his abilities to communicate ideas? Roberts wasn't, and still isn't, much of an artist, and arguably not a great writer. He is a code monkey, and by most accounts from sources, he still is a decent one. However, without the skills to express ideas visually, the medium he prefers, Roberts falls back on a technique that has trapped many muted creatives before him, references to other material. You've probably noticed Roberts is fairly active with his hands when he describes Star Citizen. This is because he's trying to create a visual representation, but those skillless hands fail him, and so it becomes a collage of images only he fully sees, and he attempts to aid them with stuttering explanations of references to other existing material. Unfortunately, this style relies heavily on references, and at a point references turn into imitation. While Star Citizen is a nebulous concept, we have a slightly more concise Squadron 42 to inspect. A sci-fi adventure starring you, a hotshot pilot in a long-shot war against giant alien German barbarians, episodically. Again, there's no finished game to critique, but there are videos and presentations to sift through. They focus on tech and filming motion capture. For now, we focus on the filming. We've established that Roberts had no actual film education, and the bigger the production budget, the bigger the problems. We approached the Eye of the Storm, where old Chris Roberts, the once video game developer, and new Chris Roberts, the Hollywood outsider, meet, and potentially cause history to rhyme once again. One of the earliest stretch goals of the whole Star Citizen project was motion-captured actors to perform characters for animators to use in Squadron 42. And with the gushing spindle top in funding, Roberts had the ability to cast more experienced actors to play character roles. Celebrity actors are no stranger to video games, and typically do voice acting, or VO meaning voiceover. Then you have mocap actors acting animations, and through the magic of technology, you melt the two performances together as best you can. Roberts made a decision that the voice actors would also perform their own motion capture, motion, facial, and performance. Let's look and see who they got for Squadron 42 proper. Hold on to your butts. Gary Oldman of Darkest Hour and Fifth Element lives in LA. Mark Hamill of Star Wars lives in LA. Mark Strong of The Long Firm and Sherlock Holmes lives in London. John Rhys Davies of Indiana Jones and Lord of the Rings lives in the UK. Jack Houston of Boardwalk Empire, soon to be Ben Hur and fucking Outlander? Oh, as a fun side note, the Outlander IP is owned by Roberts. Sources say he tried to do the Lucas thing once again with toys and marketing, like he did with the Wing Commander movie. Your lack of Outlander toys in your childhood speaks of the success of that. Uh, moving on. Ben Mendelsohn of Animal Kingdom, Dark Knight Rises, and Rogue One lives in Australia. Andy Serkis of Lord of the Rings lives in London. 
Harry Treadaway of Penny Dreadful lives in the UK. Liam Cunningham, Game of Thrones, lives in Ireland. Rona Mitra of The Practice and Boston Legal lives in London. Ian Duncan, a relatively unknown, lives in the UK. Sophie Wu of Kick-Ass 1 and 2 lives in the UK. Gemma Whelan of Game of Thrones and various video game voiceovers lives in London. Craig Fairbass of Cliffhanger and various Call of Duty game voiceovers lives in the UK. And finally, Gillian Anderson of The X-Files lives in London. Oh, and Sandy Gardner, Welcome to the Jungle and the Perception lives in LA. To get the obvious out of the way, Old Wing Commander FMB alumni Mark Hamill and John Reese davis They've worked with Roberts before, and both Mark and John have gone on record their fond memories of their experiences with Roberts. A what you would call fair deal was probably struck, but certainly their rates have gone up since the new Star Wars and Lord of the Rings movies. You pay actors within the ballpark of what they're worth, unless they willingly accept that for a small indie budget the likes of $10 million and below, that they are there for art's sake and Star Citizen at above $210 million is no indie budget and is not art. The actors themselves are only part of the cost. The actual shooting and performance capture can cost a lot more. Roberts may not be building stage sets, but new technology doesn't come cheap, something we'll explore in a later video. But in summary, Imaginarium Studios for at least three months, 100 plus days, with this cast. How much footage is there to shoot? This much. Four of the eight principal cast do not live in London, and even those that do are probably nowhere near the facilities to simply commute from their homes. No one rents apartments or trailers on their own dime for a major production like Squadron 42. That bill is paid by the producers. Transportation and catering too, because these are more than likely 8-10 to 10 hour daily shoots. Any less would be an utter waste of time and money. You pay actors for sticking around even when you're not shooting until you are absolutely finished with them, or it's explicit in the contract that they can pursue other projects while they wait on you to call upon them. For one of the earliest Squadron 42 promotional videos, Roberts featured Gary Oldman's motion, performance, and facial capture. Have a look. We have caught these attacks, raids, or skirmishes or incursions. The Vandal! We're at our gates. It will cost us. And resources. And credits. And lives. For if there's one thing the Vandal has taught us, it's that without victory, there can be no survival. This is what passes as excellence in the mind of Chris Roberts. That was painful, in my opinion. This is Gary Oldman, Oscar winner Gary Oldman, with awards and nominations as long as your driveway. It takes a special kind of director to wrangle such a bad performance out of Gary Oldman. Sources say that when Oldman asked what kind of person he was portraying, Roberts gave little direction, offering one tidbit of material. Bishop is over 100 years old. Roberts tends to rely on good actors to make bad material passable. And this performance, that so much was spent on and possibly nothing will result in, is the outcome. It was rumored, and specifically hinted, that Ullman might not only be done with his shoots as early as July 2016, but might also be completely out of the project. Of course, the most recent Squadron 42 trailer has Ullman's character fairly front and center, essentially answering those rumors. But like the spaceship commercials, we don't know if Ullman's full performance will make it to Squadron 42, or if they're essentially marketing material. We shall have to wait and see. There's a lot to unravel from Roberts' past actions and history, like pulling out a thread on a loose sweater, focusing only on his body of work as a metric of his abilities and experience, and the success of those metrics, there are a few conclusions that I come to. The first among them is that the current Chris Roberts can't produce a product unless he's supervised by a boss with power over him. Roberts outgrew smaller, less ambitious games like Time Support and Bad Blood quickly, and was under EA supervision, starting with the middle of Strike Commander. Wing Corps was the last time Roberts was directly involved with a game until its completion. EA wanted to rein him in. Microsoft booted him from Digital Anvil three years before its freelancer shipped, and Star Citizen is nearing year seven of an originally two to three year development process with no completion date in sight, and only the threat of a minimum Minimal viable, viable product, product being delivered. He's the boss now, but being his own boss has done nothing but bring him eventual failure, and anyone who has worked with Roberts directly in the past who could have reined him in has since walked off the project. 
Secondly, Roberts has apparently not learned from his mistakes. Wing 4 should have been a wake-up call as to what the story-centric space sim can reasonably accomplish, but budget concerns are once again beating in the background of Star Citizen. Remember, this is a man who, with no formal film education aside from FMV games, made arguably the biggest flop of video game movie history, and at the same time struggled against his lofty ambitions with Freelancer before being given the boot. And here he is again doing it all over again with Squadron 42 and Star Citizen. The best analogy I can think of is that he's attempting a Super Wing Commander 4 movie and a Super Freelancer game at the same time. In an interview with Penny Arcade, he said he wished somebody sat him down and told him to focus on a select few things when he directed the Wing Commander movie, and with a project of the nebulous scope of Star Citizen, that would be useful. He is once again a man of divided attention, and like the old First Nation proverb says, a man who chases two rabbits catches neither. Finally, I believe Roberts never let go of the Hollywood dream. The lure of directing A-list actors in mocap suits proved too tempting to resist, and he is directing. Ostensibly, Aaron Roberts is the one directing the development of story and mechanics of Squadron 42, but why would Chris fly nearly halfway around the world to direct the mocap when it would have been cheaper to have a good second unit director do it for him? The opinion I arrive at is Chris never let go of that dream of directing famous actors in his projects that he birthed in college. He has to be there. Those moments of being important, of being essential, in the mix of it, or at least the illusion of those things, are branded deeply into the Robert's identity, and who he imagines himself to be. The Hollywood sign may not be inside of the new CIG LA office, but Roberts knows where it is at all times. When he returns to the top of the world, not if in his mind, it will be as if he never left. His head buried deep in his dream of returning to Hollywood adoration and lifestyle, Roberts might not see the end of the runway in time. Speaking of chasing big dreams off a short pier, next chapter, we'll see what Chris's better half, and the alleged other Hollywood anchor, is up to in her pursuit of a much more clearly defined, but questionable means dream of Hollywood stardom and lifestyle.